Thank you so much for your time, Milan. I'm really grateful. I know you're a busy woman. Today was particularly busy, but I'm glad we got this in. Yeah, me too. Me or too. almost got it in. <laughs> We're here. We're here. It's awesome. So, look, the work that you have been doing, obviously, you co-founded uh, or you founded Vital Voices um, to continue the work that First Lady Hillary Clinton had done in, in empowering and uh, women globally. But, but obviously, now you're the executive director of Georgetown University's Institute for Women, Peace and Security. And... We are all, we have all, I, I think everyone, the world, around the world, right, has been absolutely um, heartbroken seeing the images that have been blazed across our screens in, from Afghanistan in recent weeks. And so the work that you're doing, it, it's always important, but there, it just feels that there's just this particularly burning urgency right now. So I would just love to to kind of talk to you a little bit over the next 30 minutes. Um, I'm mindful of, of your time and, and, and using it for maximum good um, to, to better understand what can be done to support women in Afghanistan and to get just to get more of your take on what all of us as women and, and frankly, and men can do to really support women, particularly in those countries where they do not have any of the freedoms that we so often take for granted here in the United States, my, my home country, Australia, and, 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 and many other countries in the world. Well, you're so right. Uh, there is an immediacy to this issue um, that in many ways is heartbreaking when you think about the fact that two decades ago, um, the women were suffering similarly under Taliban rule. It was horrific. I was in the White House at the time. And I remember uh, Hillary Clinton speaking out against uh, the kind of brutal and barbaric practices that we were seeing images of. You know, if your ankle stuck out under your burqa, you were flogged for that. Uh, just executions and deprivation from school, from work, et cetera. And everybody could resonate, I think, uh, with the need that these women would at some point, some way, find themselves out from under. And then for the last 20 years, uh, once the Taliban were toppled all of those years ago in 2001, uh, there has been considerable progress. Uh, I really, it's, it's uneven as it is in so many places, uh, but girls in huge numbers were back in school and loving, savoring every second of it. Women were uh, released to use their talents and capacities in all kinds of ways from parliamentarians to small business women. Um, to running key arenas of the government, et cetera. Um, you know, people who worked in civil society, running projects, running NGOs, um, just were contributors to change. And then all of a sudden, uh, and, and yes, it was slowly happening, but it was happening, and it was happening. But all of that, everything they struggled for, it's all... Um, vanished in many ways and nobody knows what the future holds mm. and i remember being in afghanistan one night uh, when i was ambassador as a group of women with a group of women i didn't know any of them at the time and the first one said to me stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are and i thought about that and thought about it and thought about coming back to the State Department and sitting around that big conference table. And if we acted on their needs, it was, you know, yes, they're victims, we need to help them, but never really seeing them um, with the abilities and leadership skills and everything that they were endowed with. Uh, and, and really it is they more than anybody who struggled against both perception and reality and uh, with great resilience, uh, moved mountains in many ways. And so 
we are now at this moment uh, when we know that uh, they now find themselves under Taliban control. They don't know if they're going back um, to the 19, late 1990s, although early indications are that nothing has changed given what's happening. The women are experiencing a campaign of intimidation and terror, getting threatening calls in the middle of the night, having their offices ransacked um, out in the provinces. Uh, girls are being taken away from their families, uh, either for purposes of trafficking or for early marriage with a Taliban soldier, but just a whole range of, of horrific um, movie, the movie reel, it seems to, to go off and take us back where we were. And so immediately, I think the first um, challenge and uh, responsibility we have is to evacuate as many of the particularly most threatened high risk uh, women who um, are already experiencing the threats, but because they were prominent, because they bucked the Taliban, so to speak, uh, because they were engaged in ways uh, that did not mesh with the way Taliban see women and women's role, um, they are extremely um, at risk. And so evacuating them has been a top priority for all of us. And you know, we, like others, uh, managed to get out several hundred in the last couple of weeks. There are still many hundreds more uh, that need to find their way out. How that will happen remains to be seen uh, because the airport is no longer under US military control. Uh, the airport is not in great shape. It needs to be, I gather, rehabilitated. Um, it's not clear as the Qataris, will they manage it? Uh, will it have commercial flights again? Will it have charter flights? Will, in other words, will the airport once again be a place uh, where flights, evacuation flights can take off? And there's a lot of exploration of land um, overland uh, uh, evacuations through border areas into Uzbekistan or Pakistan or whatever. So that is an immediate priority. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the issue of what happens to them when they get on that plane. And we have yeah. numbers here already. We've got a group in Wisconsin, a group leaving Germany, uh, the whole resettlement issue. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that most of them will come here and be admitted under something called humanitarian parole, which is a special category for a refugee. It, is, it has the advantage of being quick um, and addressing the immediate needs, but it has a disadvantage in terms of uh, people in this category don't benefit from the refugee uh, services and benefits that are typically allocated. Uh, to um, uh, to to the, the the regular refugees, and so resources yeah. um, as 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 well as appeals to the Congress to rectify this situation, given the emergency and the need, and what these women have achieved. Um, but that will be uh, a need, and then we can go into other humanitarian needs of those left behind. Yeah, look, and obviously, the fact is. Where there's enough political will, there's a way. So, in terms of the visa that you know that or the, that they that they're able to enter into the U.S. under, uh, I would have thought, particularly given this situation and the the the, the extreme nature of it, um, there needs to be just enough pressure pressure applied applied to the right people to to get that those those uh, policies changed. In terms of uh, just obviously there is fundraising. I know the, the Institute for Women, Peace and Security has fundraising. I know Vital Voices and I will be making sure I share links to those Thank um, you. people who want to raise funds. I want to just kind of zoom out a little bit here more and speak to you. You've been doing work and you wrote a book in 2015 um, that, that I actually read, which was Fast Forward, and it was really about helping women find their purpose and their power. And that's something that 
I did my own PhD in and I have a big passion around. Um, and so it is easy for us to look at our own small little neck of the woods and rail against everything that's not fair and that's not right and the sexism that women and the barriers and the biases that women still have to deal with in the US, in, in Australia, in countries around the world. Um, obviously, we have relatively little to complain about compared to women such as those that you're just talking about um, that are just dealing with extraordinary brutality and oppression. But when it comes to really amplifying our power as change agents, those of us who do not have to fear being flogged or killed or sold off, um, what do you say to women who might be listening to this or to the men who champion women when it comes to owning their own power as change agents and, and speaking up for the rights of other women and, and actually, honestly, just em empowering themselves and their own agency? You know, that's uh, such a wonderful question, Marjorie. And I still believe despite it's actually, setbacks. It's actually Margie. <laughs> Margie. I still believe, despite the uh, setbacks, that um, what we wrote those few years ago is still as relevant today as it was then. And that's the belief that each of us does indeed um, have power. And if we have purpose uh, in terms of what we want to achieve, uh, and our hope with the book was that it would achieve progress for women and girls, and and take that, that, that purpose, that motivation, that aspiration, combine it with the power each of us has, no matter where we sit, no matter what we do, um, and use the connectivity that our world allows us to have today, whether it's networks in an office or networks overseas, uh, or just quick ways to communicate with each other and, and be those agents of change. I think that is very much with us. And it is frankly, one of the few ways in which change will happen. It will happen when good people come together uh, and really uh, determine that they're going to try to affect some kind of outcome for good. And, you know, and I believe deeply in the need for male allies, uh, as we wrote in, in Fast Forward, some of the changes that came to companies that came to the broader um, positive impacts uh, that those companies engaged in came because of enlightened male leadership and the understanding uh, that it just wasn't the right thing to do. It was indeed, uh, but it was the smart thing to do as a business investment. Certainly we were looking at it from an economic point of view. Uh, it was a win-win. Everybody wins from this. It's not a zero-sum game. If you succeed, you don't set back the prospects for somebody else not succeeding. Uh, and to understand that we are all in this together, and the more that all of this uh, talent and uh, tapping the diversity that it represents can be unleashed, the better we're all going to do. Um, now, there have been a lot of setbacks, and I think COVID, for example, is one of the huge setbacks uh, uh, in terms of a lot of that progress, certainly economic progress. Certainly, if you look at the United States today, the number of women uh, disproportionately out of the workforce uh, in numbers that never occurred before, uh, how long it will take for them to come back uh, remains to be seen. Uh, disproportionate impacts in terms of the violence that, that came along with the, the uh, lockdowns, um, the tremendous um, impacts uh, in terms of um, rates of poverty uh, increasing exponentially around the world and certainly impacts here at home. Women have disproportionately borne the brunt of COVID. Uh, if we build back better, if we are to build back better, indeed, it needs to be more than a slogan. And it really needs to have a gender lens applied to it. Because unless we address these consequences and recognize once and for all that women aren't marginal players in this, but they are, as the Afghans told me, they are leaders to move things forward. Uh, we, we have to apply that to the kinds of solutions that we put forward. 
Yeah, obviously there's a compelling data about the number of women who left the workforce too and the, and the she session, which is something I've I've written about and and when and getting women back into the workforce and supporting them and obviously in many parts of the world there are still massive restrictions um, and there's still a, 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 many women who are struggling we're, we're obviously not out of this pandemic yet um, and yet the the subject keeps changing and if it vanishes from the front page will we ever catch up and do what we need to do i think one of the other interesting aspects of all of this is recognizing the role of childcare uh, in terms of women's economic participation. You know, 20 years ago, when we were working on childcare as a domestic policy issue, it was, it was viewed as marginal. You know, why, why, are, why do you want Congress to do anything about this? Uh, and yet the reality is you cannot divorce women's economic participation if they have families uh, and elder care is an issue, of course, as well, from their ability to do uh, what they need to be doing uh, within their families. I would hope that that understanding, that realization, that data that is now um, a huge evidence-based case will move us uh, to really act on policies uh, that long needed to be adopted uh, and, and have not been. And similar in, similarly, in the United States, you know, the, the, the importance of parental leave, paid parental leave, yeah. you know, to be the only industrial country in the world that doesn't have it. Again, COVID has demonstrated that these insurance protections really need to be available. And, and in many ways, we have suffered worse consequences because that protective shield was not here. Yeah. Um, so I hope we learn from this mm -hmm. uh, and, and that we as potential agents of change um, really do more to, to put that pressure on uh, to finally achieve some of these uh, important uh, goals if we're going to move in a better direction. Yes, it, as it's long been said, until society, until we value caregiving as much as we value breadwinning, the playing field will not be leveled. And obviously the large bulk of expectation and responsibility still falls disproportionately on the on the shoulders of women, you know, and the, and the mother load, not just the, the physical load, but the mental load as well of all of those aspects, which we've really witnessed just just pile on even more throughout the last you know, 18 months or so. As we kind of look toward the future, obviously uh, there needs to be policy changes um, of, on a domestic front, but on an international front and a global coalition to support the rights of women, but also to the economic empowerment of women. And you mentioned a minute ago that obviously it's not a zero sum game. You know, when women rise, society is better off. However, one could look at many countries in the world, and Afghanistan obviously is a, is a pressing case in point, and see that there are men who for millennia have dominated highly patriarchal societies that are highly threatened by the empowerment of women uh, and who, who do see their own place in society and their own sense of identity being extremely threatened by the empowerment of women. And so what is your thoughts on how do we ameliorate against that 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 fear reaction and from men who are threatened by the advancement of women? Well, it is it is one of the most uh, important questions and I think that one of the greatest barriers uh, as you pointed out is what I would call the need to change norms mindsets, um, stereotypes, all of those kinds of um, attitudes uh, that really prevent men from seeing the, the, the positive as opposed to how much they're going to lose in the process. And that is to change, norms can be changed, yeah. but cultural shifts are are take time. Yeah. 
-hmm. And one of the things um, that we've certainly learned uh, in the years of trying to advance the, the ball down the field, so to speak, um, is that men need to be a part of the solution, uh, whether they're traditional um, uh, leaders in, in villages, whether they are uh, religious leaders uh, who have a, a strong hold on um, some of these attitudes, uh, whether it's uh, leaders, you know, I, I think of uh, uh, the work done in Australia when um, uh, there was an effort, an ongoing effort to address violence against women. And uh, I've forgotten her name at the moment, being that kind of day. Um, Julia said, Gillard, the Prime Minister Julia? No, it wasn't no. Julia. It was, uh, she was, um, it, it, she Liz, was head of the Anti-Discrimination Commission. Liz, Liz Broderick. Liz, Liz. And Liz said to me that she just was beside herself and trying to figure out what the heck would begin to make a dent. And she called up some of her top, friends, CEOs, all, male, all, and said, you've got to do something. Uh, so whether it's at that village level or whether it's at the, the, the more sophisticated corporate level, uh, it's, it's the problem that you set out, but it's a problem that needs to be first recognized and secondly addressed. And, you know, I've had so many experiences where I've seen this uh, play out, um, in India, a few years ago, I was overseeing uh, or announcing a USAID grant um, that was to empower village men to try to do something about violence against women. And they did it through skits and they played both roles, the male and the female roles. And I could see, you know, don't strike her, everything played out um, dramatically. And then you know, about a year later, I got a call from or an email from the organization that was implementing the program. And it said, when are you coming back? Um, because the men want to talk to you. And I thought, oh, I wonder what the heck has been going on. And what they wanted to talk about when I got back to India, I asked them, I said, so have you had great success with this program? Or are you feeling bad about how it's gone? Oh, no, no violence against women, not such a problem anymore. We don't have so much incidents. I said, well, why do you want to talk to me? Because we want to tell you we have changed. We no longer see the male macho behavior as the way we should be conducting our lives. Yeah. And we feel free. We feel different. Mm -hmm. And then I was uh, at another uh, village in, um, in Senegal. And the women said to me, what can we do? This is this horrible practice of female genital mutilation is, is killing us in childbirth. It's causing great pain, yeah. but you cannot move from here to being accepted in your society without going through the ritual. Yeah. And they started a process of going to their village leaders, to the imams, to the leaders in the village. Long story short, village after village, because they realized they intermarry, the men went and made the case. They changed the norm from FGM to the health of our women. Uh, Sweden and what they've done with parental leave policy, where the young fathers are now saying, why were we deprived all these years mm. of this opportunity to bond? It takes time. It takes seeing the difference. It takes leadership but it is all about biases, attitudes, norms, patriarchal ways of thinking and dealing. Uh, but we have to get at that because it is fundamental. Yeah, I, 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 I uh, couldn't agree more. I, I think it was Hillary Clinton who said that the number one resource in the world is the untapped potential of women. And I may have got my wording on that wrong but if we could just unlock the potential in half the world's population you know what would be possible and uh and i i i have a real passion for doing that and i do think to your point though it it we need men and women both 
uh, on board with this. And Liz Broderick did uh, start out that Male mm -hmm. Champions for Change initiative, which yes. really yes. took off in Australia. Um, and I know myself, I have a husband who's always been very supportive of me pursuing what I felt called to pursue while also between us raising four kids, which sometimes, you know, was a bit of a juggling act. And <laughs> but, I know. Yeah, but I think that when we have men supporting us um, and championing us and, and making a stand against those um, very gendered um, barriers that can work against women and those biases and those sometimes very sexist norms, it makes such a, a, such a profound difference. So in just kind of finishing up our conversation, and again, I'm, I'm grateful for your, your time. And as, as we look toward the future and we, we realize obviously there is just enormous problems. Uh, and obviously Afghanistan isn't the only country in the world. It's just the one that is on our hearts and minds the most right now and where we have witnessed just barbarity against women. Um, if there's, if there's just one thing that you would encourage people to do uh, at an individual kind of level that they can do to help to move that needle, um, what would it be? It, it is fundamentally what we put in the book, the recognition that each of us can indeed make a difference uh, and that today we have the opportunity, we have the basis with the evidence-based case that this is a, a positive uh, way to move forward uh, that we need to tap that. The other thing I would say is we more broadly need to recognize that the well being of women and the well being of countries goes hand in hand. Uh, at Georgetown, we do an index, a Women, Peace, and Security Index, um, and it is, it is looking at the, the dimensions that affect a woman's well being. So one dimension is inclusion, the kinds of things we've been talking about, economic participation, political participation, education. <clears throat> Another dimension uh, is security. Are you secure in your home? Are you secure in your community? And the third dimension is discrimination. Are there practices that impede your ability uh, to, to be well off, to, to prosper uh, as a woman? And you, you really need all of these dimensions because if you just look at education and you don't look at the ability to go to school safely, for example, and not be abused or whatever, mm -hmm. you don't get this picture. But the bottom line is that there is a direct correlation between the well being of women and the state of nations in terms of um, whether they're conflict ridden whether they're destabilizing, whether they're uh, at the bottom in terms of their economic progress. Um, and as one ranks all of these, these countries on that barometer of the well-being of women, you can see immediately who's doing well and who's not doing well and that correlation with the state of the women. And so it's just critical uh, to, to be able to continue to pursue um, this agenda because so much depends on it. Yeah, absolutely. The elevation of women does not mean the descent of men. It actually just means the elevation of all of us. So, yeah. You, you have a way with words. No wonder you're in the business you're in. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm grateful. I'm delighted to have met you and really love to get involved in what you're doing there. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's terrific. Wonderful. All right. We'll, we'll stay in touch. I shall do.